Over the past two decades, the number of American students who have studied abroad has more than tripled. Countries around the world continue to become more accessible, allowing professors and students opportunities to understand their international topics in context. And world-class companies seek global-ready grads who are internationally competent. It's Academe Today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Jamie Liddy, the Director of Broadcasting here at UNCP. With me today to talk about study abroad is Mr. Alex Brandt, our Study Abroad Coordinator, who is also serving right now as the Director of International Programs, and Dr. Kelly Ficklin, a professor in the Department of Elementary Education. Thank you for coming today and agreeing to be on the show, and welcome to the TV studio, because I understand it's the first time for both of you. Yeah, thank okay. you for having us. Thank right. you. Well, it's great to have you, and I'm excited to learn about study abroad here at UNC Pembroke. Alex, let's start with you. Help me define study abroad, because I know the term can encompass a wide range of experiences, everything from a whole year at another university mm -hmm. to as little as nine days with a professor on what they call uh, a short course. Exactly, exactly. So when it comes to study abroad, I think of it as a way to take what a student has learned in the classroom and then immersing themselves in a culture that is different from their, from their own overseas. And so it's the idea of a student immersing themselves in, in a culture that is um, unique to whatever it is that they're studying. Um, at UNCP, we have two different options. You can either go for a short term, as you, as you pointed out, so you can go for a week or two, or you can go for an entire semester or year, depending on what the student wants to do. Okay, and a short course is for credit or it's a class trip. Can you describe that a little bit? Sure, yeah, that's exactly right. So if a student is uh, taking a study abroad course, they are getting credit for their experience. So if they're going for a short term, then they're getting three credits. And if they're going for a semester or for a year, then they're able to actually take multiple courses while they're overseas. And so just like a student would sign up for four or five classes here at UNCP, they can sign up for four or five classes overseas. And the great thing is, is that they're actually paying UNCP tuition and fees here and yet being able to go abroad and take those classes and have those transfer back here to UNCP. Do they need to be language ready in order to do a semester somewhere? You don't have to. Most of the courses that students can take overseas are offered in English, but I always encourage my students, regardless of whether they are doing a language immersion program, which they can do if they choose, um, but regardless of whether they're doing a language immersion program or not, I always tell the students to take a class, take at least one course that is teaching them about the local history, the local culture, and uh, often that involves learning the local language. Because one of the things that I've found, and I hear this time and time again from my students, is that if they get to know the local culture, if they learn the local language, even just a little bit, that they get a more inside view of what that culture is like and the people that they're interacting with. And it just makes for a more intimate experience, which is really what I think study abroad is all about. It's about studying overseas, but having an intimate look into what that culture is all about. What led you to a career that helps others go overseas? That's a great question. <laughs> um, for me, study abroad had such a large impact on my life. Um, I did a, uh, an overseas experience when I was 17, and that led me to do two study abroads when I was in college, and it just it changed my worldview. It, it had me look at the world differently. It had me look at the way I spend money differently, and the world is so interconnected in a way that it has never been before. We're, we talk about globalization, but what does that really mean? Well, in a lot of respects, it's about you can find out information from another group of people 
like that instantaneously. And so whether you're doing business with someone from overseas or collaborating on a project or uh, if you go into academia, you need to know what other people are thinking and how they're processing. And so for me, it was initially just an interest to, to travel and um, really a curiosity to see what the world is like. And so one of the things that I tell students often is I tell them, let your curiosity be your compass. And that's really been a driving force for me in how I look at travel, how I look at study abroad, and why I came down here to UNCP to try and encourage these students to have similar experiences. That should be a slogan on the website for the IP office. Let your curiosity be your compass. I love that. Yes, but just make sure that I get to trademark that. Okay? <laughs> That's right. Okay. That's right. So how robust is study abroad at UNC Pembroke? It's fairly robust, but there's a lot of room for growth. Um, we have a lot of active faculty who are very passionate and interested to take students overseas. Um, but we, we definitely need more students to have these experiences. Um, right here at UNCP, um, we have around 2% uh, of our student population is going on study abroad. Now you may think that that's a fairly low number, but that's right actually on with the national average. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but with that said, we really want to make sure that more students have these opportunities. So one of my goals is to go out to each of the freshman seminars and speak to students and let them know about study abroad opportunities as well as talk to them about some of the uh, financial opportunities that are out there for them so that they can partake in these experiences. But overall I see a real passion and um, I see a real drive from the university not only from faculty but all the way up to the uh, Chancellor's Office supporting um, not only internationalization efforts but study abroad in particular. Dr. Ficklin, tell us about your annual trip to Belize. It is annual, right? And I think it involves a service component. Right. This, is our th this will be our third uh, spring coming up that we'll go to Belize. And um, we cross-list this course with um, our health and wellness class. And so last year our students collected PE equipment and we took PE equipment and donated it to the schools there. Um, then when we get there, we try to donate two days of our time to some type of service, depending on what the need is of the school. So when I was in my doc program, I had to do an international study. We went to Belize, so I made connections there. So I have a very good friend who is a principal of a school there, so that's where we do our work. Okay, when you were in your PhD program mm -hmm. for element, elementary education, they required international travel. Yeah, for um, my higher ed leadership, mm -hmm. you had to do one... Uh, course for international study. All right, well we have some pictures from, I think it's a recent trip to Belize that we can look at. They'll show us that in uh, about a minute. So is this the school you volunteer for? So um, on the left is New Horizon, which is a public school. We go in a public school and a private school. Um, and that's just a group of the students there. Mm -hmm. And on the right is a private school. And that's Isla Benita, which is where my friend is the principal. And so um, that, the lady in the yellow is Morgan, and she is teaching those children. So is she one of our students? She's one of our okay. students. Mm -hmm. Good. And let's see what else. And that is another one of our students teaching, again, in Isla Benita. And do they have to know Spanish there for you? No. Students? One of the beauties of Belize is the, um, the country speaks three languages, and English is their first language or their required language, but they also speak Spanish and Creole. Okay. And the kids begin at age four speaking all three languages in school. All right. Yeah. So again on the left is, that is um, community service day. So all the students in the entire school were underneath that um, covering. Mm -hmm. uh, it's about 110 degrees. There's no air conditioning in the schools. <laughs> Great. So um, the kids are used to it, but we are not. Mm -hmm. And that's Dr. Granger in that picture. So the firemen were doing a presentation for the children. And then they, um, the iguanas are becoming extinct in Belize, so we go to the oh. 
iguana exhibit and that's where they raise babies and then set them out into the wild. But we can hold them and visit with them and um, most of my students don't really want to touch them to begin with but then they all <laughs> evident by the end they will hold them. And this is the required picture posing with the UNCP pennant, right? <laughs> yes. So that's a nice take on that. We have a lot of those pictures. We tried to do it everywhere we went and everything okay. we did. That's right. Good. And so I think you get a lot of downtime as well. Let's see what else you did. An archaeological site. Yes, yeah, so that is Sananchanich, which is a, a Mayan ruin site, and it is in the city of San Ignacio. So we spend some time in San Ignacio, which is inland, and then we teach in San Pedro, which is on the island. And so um, that is the group learning about the Mayan ruins, and uh, it's okay. very interesting because that's like a city, a Mayan city. Right, right. And then this oh. is cave tubing. So we cave actually- Cave tubing. Cave tubing. <laughs> so we are all tied together there so we don't lose anyone, but <laughs> there's the entrance to the cave just behind them. And they do have helmets with, we have helmets with lights on. And so we go into the cave and um, again, there's uh, Mayan architecture and uh, different things in there. Uh, old pottery and we will stop and climb up into a cave and like shimmy on your belly to get into the cave oh so it's uh, it's really cool because for many of these guys they are stepping out of their comfort zone Absolutely. and we ask students all the time in our classes to step out of their comfort zone so if we're not willing to step out of our comfort zones ourselves how can we ask our kids to do it I'd like to see the risk assessment for that trip, <laughs> but go on. Is I'll have this, to plead uh, the fifth on that. Is this at your hotel or? No, this is on the beach, so we walk everywhere. And um, San Pedro is an island, it only has three streets, so this is where we have breakfast our first morning, always. This is Estelle's, and that's the view at breakfast. And then we walk just down the street a little further to our school. Great, and I think that's our last picture today. Dr. Ficklin, what makes you want to do it, especially because you go back to the same location, and I'm sure the students are excited, but you're repeating many of the same experiences. Why, why do it? Well, I think the opportunity is amazing for our students. Many of our students have not been out of the United States, but more importantly, I'm trying to teach them to respect doing more with less. And so we always make these excuses in education that we can't do certain things because we don't have enough money for technology. We don't have enough money for extra books. Well, in the schools in Belize, they don't have books and they don't have technology. They have a whiteboard and the teacher does all of the preparation. There's a national curriculum, which means everybody on the same day at the same time in the whole country is supposed to be doing the is same thing. Right? So they have to prepare themselves though. And so if they don't buy their own computer, they don't even have anything to find the resources and references to use. And so they create their own lessons, but they better be teaching whatever that content is on their standards. And so I want our kids to realize and understand that teaching is about the people. Learning is about the people. You can do it without books. You can do it without computers. You can do it with whatever, as long as you care about your kids. And so um, if we can change their outlook on life and the way our students look at things differently, like when we packed, they were only allowed to bring a carry-on and half of the carry-on literally was filled with PE equipment. So they had a half a carry-on for 12 days in Belize and they were freaking out, but they wow. did it and everything was fine. So they just, I just want them to appreciate that and to embrace a new culture and realize that even though we're going somewhere else, we're all alike. We all have the same needs and we're all people. And um, I love watching the way it changes our students. It sounds like a real labor of love for you. It, How does the School of Education value your efforts? I mean, do they think that international preparation is important for teacher ed? I think they embrace it. Um, I think I was the first person that was really interested in the School of Ed to take the students abroad. And um, I have Dr. Granger with us, and she's gone with me for the last two years. And we're gonna bring, we have a new faculty member, Dr. Whittington, so she'll go in May with us um, so that she can learn and maybe someone else can, you know, so I don't do it every single time. And um, Karen and I are perfect together because I'm all about making the students just grow, and she's all about letting everybody know about it. So, and so she is the media person, <laughs> and she wa likes watching the students grow too, but she sees it in a different way. She sees the business side, so she's reached out for fundraising efforts for our students because 
for our students, it's quite difficult for them to um, afford it. But the department totally supports me in this, and we try to find a class that matches so that they can either get credit for study abroad or our class as well. Um, Alex, I know you said earlier that study abroad does have to be credit bearing at UNCP, but are there um, service projects or what, what we might have called at religious schools mission trips right. um, that students also go on here in conjunction with UNCP? Yes, and um, one of the great things about um, study abroad here at the university is that it is very supportive of students who are interested in doing study abroad. So whether they're taking a credit-bearing class here at UNCP and then going overseas, or if they want to do volunteer work, uh, do a mission trip, as you mentioned, they can get credit for that. I had a student recently reach out to me, and uh, she's interested in volunteering, doing some mission work in Uganda. We can give them credit for that. Um, so it's just about connecting students, making sure they're informed, and making sure that you have um, faculty like Dr. Ficklin, who really are the pioneers to get study abroad out to our students, out there speaking about it so that students are aware of their opportunities. Tell us about International Education Week that's coming up in November. Yes, International Education Week. We're very excited for this. Um, it's, it's a national um, week, actually. So universities all across the country are celebrating International Education Week. It's November 13th through the 17th, so it's right before the Thanksgiving holiday. And it's an opportunity for universities to showcase their international student population, international scholars, internationalization efforts, study abroad. It's really an opportunity for everyone to get together and celebrate the international um, efforts and uh, initiatives that are here on campus. So we have some great events planned. We have um, a trivia night. Um, we also have a study abroad where faculty and students can come and showcase their study abroad experiences or talk about future trips like the trip to Belize that's happening in May. Is that the information tables every day in the, yes. the UC? Exactly. They call it the mall, that long corridor. Right, so in the, in the UC lounge in, in the mall, um, there's going to be booths set up, tables set up uh, during the lunch hour every day, Monday through Friday. And then at the end, um, on Friday, there's going to be an international festival. And so food will be out and students will have an opportunity to play games and learn about uh, all kinds of different international projects. One of the events that I'm really excited for is uh, we are having a guest speaker come in and talk about her personal experiences studying abroad, and she's going to speak to a very specific audience. Um, we're calling it Black and Studying Abroad. And so she's going to talk about some of the obstacles that she had as an African-American woman traveling overseas. And so we're partnering with uh, student organizations like the African Student Organization and other clubs to really kind of find out what kind of obstacles students of color might have when it comes to studying abroad. And that's one of the things that I'm really excited for. This is a pilot program, but hopefully after this, we can start reaching other target um, audiences and really finding out, well, why do you want to do study abroad? Or why don't you? And how can we tackle some of those uh, obstacles? Mm -hmm. And that guest speaker is an evening event, am I right? It's actually late afternoon. Late afternoon. Uh, late okay. afternoon on the 16th of November. And is that also in the UC lounge, just open to anyone? That's actually going to be in Dial Building, I believe. Okay. We haven't finalized the room yet, um, but uh, it should be in Dial. But um, right now, that's going to be open to uh, just students of color at this point. OK. Um, how can students afford a faculty-led short course or a whole summer or a semester abroad. Like Dr. Ficklin mentioned, the School of Ed tries to do a little bit of fundraising, right. but um, our students are financially strapped as it is, just to pay regular tuition and housing. What opportunities are there for funding? Great, and it's a great question because there really are some obstacles for our students. But there's also um, perceived obstacles, as I like to call them, um, because we do have a lot of opportunities for our students. We have scholarships, we have scholarships that are available here at the university. Um, we also have external scholarships, resources that I can point students to so that if they do a little bit of research, do a little bit of homework, then maybe they can get some funding for, uh, for their trip. The other really great thing is that students can use financial aid for their study abroad experience. And that's one of the reasons why professors like Professor Ficklin will have a course taught in the spring, but then travel during May because then 
students can use their financial aid package from the spring term and have that apply to their right. to their study abroad, which That's is which is I great cost it. saving. Mm -hmm. Right, I did it, and it was a second eight weeks course, so I even had longer to recruit technically oh. because it didn't mm -hmm. start in January, and their tuition was already on their spring their pay one price, and so then they were only paying, you know, the airfare, hotel, and all, all those right. expenses. And I know in my department, someone twice had tried a summer study abroad where it was a standalone course to Argentina. Three credits they're paying, and then the travel. And study abroad, mm -hmm. right. And then uh, couldn't get enough students to make. Then he tried it the following summer to tag on to Dr. Hanner's trip to Costa Rica. So the biology students would have their rainforest part of it, and the video students would be documenting the whole mm -hmm. thing. But again, for three credits, and that was really beyond our students' you know, ability to pay. Exactly, exactly. And one of my long-term goals is to get the university um, to support faculty on these short-term faculty-led study abroad trips. I really want uh, the university to be able to say, all right, if you are a professor, like you mentioned, Dr. Liddy, or um, you know, Dr. Ficklin, if you're really passionate and interested in doing study abroad, you're going to put in the work and effort to take a group of students overseas, which is a lot of work, <laughs> um, how can we support you, right? How can we make sure that the price point per student remains relatively low, but you as a professor who's doing a lot of work and planning this trip are compensated and compensated fairly? Because one of the things that I've learned is that faculty can use a third-party provider or they can plan the trip on their own, and it's a real juggling act. I would rather that be taken out of the equation to say, look, we're, we're going to help pay for the, for the professor to go, and then that way um, the students can get the most out of their experience and really um, keep that uh, cost as low as possible for our students. Mm -hmm. Do you expect the $500 per semester tuition that's coming starting next fall to free up more disposable income for our students to do study abroad? I really hope so. <laughs> um, I would love to see that uh, happen, and it's one of the reasons why I'm trying to speak to as many freshmen as possible. I've been doing that this fall. I'll continue to do it in the spring a little bit, but then do it again in the fall. I really want students to say, okay, I'm saving a little bit of money. Where can I spend that? I'd rather them spend it on study abroad rather than getting some new Nikes or something like that. <laughs> so I really hope that students will see that cost saving and their parents or whomever might be supporting them uh, with their education to look at this and say, I have some extra money or some potential extra student loans that can be used towards study abroad. Well, why? Because it really is an investment in their education. Um, I was reading that there's a survey out of University of Georgia, almost 20% of students who do study abroad are more likely to graduate than those who don't. And so, you know, this idea of saying, if you're going to do study abroad, think about it really as an investment in your education. Mm -hmm. Now, I think we have a few group shots from some trips in the past that you might recognize. You okay. might be able to tell us what we're looking at here, and they'll show us a picture. Ah, yes. <laughs> that was a great trip. This actually was uh, from last year. Um, this was the foreign languages trip to Spain. So um, you have uh, the two professors there, um, Milagros the and front? Cecilia. Okay. Uh, yes, so um, uh, Milagros uh, uh, Lopez is up there in the front, and then uh, Dr. Lara Cecilia is in the back with the, uh, the sunglasses, and all the students are riding one of those tour buses in downtown Madrid, getting a, a great view of the city. But they thought it would be a little bit warmer uh, since they were going to Spain, but this was March, so uh, I think some of them were a little cold, but they really enjoyed the That the could time almost there. be Manhattan. Right? I thought it was. Yeah. yeah. Let's see. This is a very large class. Which class is this? Yeah, so this actually is the choir's trip to Mexico last okay. year. And so this was a unique study abroad opportunity where a group of uh, singers from UNCP went down to a partner school uh, in Mexico to sing and perform. Um, so it was, a, it was a big undertaking, but the students had an amazing experience and got a lot out of the, uh, the performances that they did while they were there. I think we have at least one more. All right, two different trips maybe here? Yes, um, so we have uh, two different pictures here. One on the right is uh, from 
uh, Bangor in uh, Wales. And so if you look at the bottom, uh, you'll see a young man there with glasses. That is Travis, who is one of our students here at UNCP. And he decided to embark on a semester-long study abroad in Bangor. Um, well, that's at Bangor one of our partner universities? At, okay. one, of our partner universities. at okay. one of our partner universities, that's exactly right, in Wales. And then the other picture on the left, uh, it's cut off there a little bit, um, but you will see that is uh, Naveen, and that is one of our UNCP students who did a summer program at the University of Seoul, which is also one of our partner programs. Mm -hmm. And what's really great about her story is that um, Naveen is a pre-med student. She's in the Honors College, and she really wanted to do study abroad. I, I'd been talking with her for several months last, last academic year, and uh, we tried to see if she could go for a semester. It wasn't going to happen. As both of you probably know, with some of the requirements here at UNCP, it's hard to take certain classes overseas. And uh, she was too far along in her academic career to do a semester overseas without extending her time uh, here. Her at graduation. Date. Her graduation. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. And so, um, but she really wanted to do it, and uh, partly because I think I, uh, you know, kept pushing her a little bit. Uh, but she, she and I finally worked to an agreement where she could do a study abroad over the summer. And so even someone who is in the honors college, someone who has a very rigorous academic plan, who still wants to graduate on time. She made the opportunity to do study abroad in South Korea for, for a summer. And again, she was able to pay UNCP tuition here and yet was able to go overseas. So it was a really wonderful opportunity for her. Um, Dr. Ficklin, we have about a minute left, but I did want to mention that you're involved with a youth exchange program in your community that takes teens to and from Scotland. And I know it's not, it's not academic per se, it's more of a cultural exchange, but um, what do you think is important about it? Um, I think the most important thing, again, is learning about new cultures and building relationships. And I, just as Alex said, um, I think people that have an interest in learning about other cultures, I just think it makes them stronger people. And I, um, I think it broadens their horizons to do better things and more things in life. Great. Then I, I agree. And uh, the U.S. is sending and receiving more students abroad than ever before, but still less than 10% of American students will spend any time in another country as part of their academic careers. UNCP is trying to address that curve here with concerted efforts to interest students and support faculty. Thanks to my guests, Mr. Alex Brandt from International Programs and Dr. Kelly Ficklin, a faculty member who promotes global experiences at Pembroke and in the community. Let's close out the show with a little compilation of my class trip to Ireland. <laughs>